Hi, welcome to ITV Asia. My name is Claire Chen. I'm your host of Luxury Branding in China. Today, join us as our special guest, Peter Alassas. Uh, it's the general manager of Westin Hotel in Shanghai. Hi, Peter. Hello, Claire. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, for inviting me. Thank you for coming with us uh, on this uh, luxury branding and share us with your experience. Would you like to introduce me uh, a little bit about yourself and how you've been in China and uh, being with Westin Hotel? Well, I've been with the Starwood Group uh, for over 20 years now. Uh, originally started in Bangkok at the Royal Orchid Sheraton, mm -hmm. and of course moved around as one would expect in that 20 year time frame to different parts of, of Asia, which included Brunei, Thailand, Indonesia, of course, uh, uh, Kuala Lumpur for a while, uh, and Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, short stint in the Middle East, in Tokyo. Uh, in Kyoto and now in um, in Shanghai since uh, 2003, I believe, is when I came here. So um, I'll be here uh, going on to five years uh, very soon, and I've enjoyed it immensely. That's great. Um, we all know uh, Western Hotel is a renowned uh, luxury hotel, and in your past like four years experience uh, in Shanghai, will you compare uh, like the difference, what's the main challenge for uh, a luxury hotel here, mm -hmm. and what the compare the difference uh, to other market? Mm -hmm. Well, the fundamentals of running a business are basically the same the world over. Uh, I wouldn't be doing anything in terms of leadership management. Uh, I wouldn't be doing anything different if I were in London, Sydney, or New York, or anywhere else for that matter. So. Running a business, the fundamentals, as I say, are, are pretty much consistent. I, and I should point out that the three basic fundamentals are sales, service, and costs. So uh, if you manage to tackle those uh, three main areas, if you like, uh, you're on your way to success. Uh, as far as execution is concerned, there it's a, it's a little bit different because you have to take culture into account and the local environments. Uh, the local markets, of course, which change from place to place. So there you need to have a very open mind, a different attitude, so that you can absorb quickly what's going on, which will enable you to craft strategies and make appropriate decisions that are appropriate to the particular location. So uh, those would be the differences, the fundamental differences. Um, I think if you if you drill in a little bit deeper, then it, it, it really comes into to the cultural issues, cultural aspects, and and how you work with people and uh, uh, how they execute on standards, which might which tend to be a little bit different from place to place. But that's why we are here to make those adjustments uh, and and to, to the refinements as we go. So uh, yes, there are differences, uh, those that one would expect, and there are differences that are, as I say, universal and very much consistent. And uh, where you have general managers, for instance, that move every two or three years, they accumulate an enormous amount of experience. And I think the international exposure is what gives the professional maturity, because skills, you can teach anybody skills. Mm -hmm. But how do you, you cannot teach experience. You right. can't even teach attitude. So that you learn as you go. And uh, the more of that you do, the more um, experienced and the more um, insightful one can be, which is very important. Okay. So we know um, actually the uh, luxury market in China is booming. Um, also, we see a lot of the increase of hot, um, like luxury hotels, boutique hotels, and uh, oh. one after the other is open in Shanghai. Right. Uh, how can a uh, Western hotel uh, to maintain the, lead, uh, the leading uh, luxury hotel position in Shanghai? Uh, what's your main competitive advantage? Right. Well, uh, every, every hotel has unique aspects, or every business has its unique uh, marketing, sales, product proposition, if you like. Uh, in our case, it's the location. You know, we are blessed to be in a historically the historic Bund area, uh, uh, and it is it is a prime location for all the obvious reasons. Uh, we are, in a sense, part of history, although the Bund has been around for a long time. But we we are part of the modern uh, history of the Bund, if you like. Uh, the location certainly is one. Uh, the second competitive advantage or main feature is the architecture and the design of the building. Uh, it's a very user-friendly building. It's very colorful. It's very uplifting. Uh, 
uh, and it very much um, is consistent, if you like, with our new uh, branding proposition, you know, which is all about renewal and rejuvenation. Uh, so it's it's a happy place, you know. It's not it's a place that's colorful and you know we're not pretentious in the way we carry out our duties. Uh, you know, you can still be five stars and you can still be modern and relaxed uh, without being pretentious and uh, and above all not not being in people's face. Uh, you know, the important thing is to be around when the customer wants you to be around, when when uh, rather than when it's convenient for you to be around. And uh, so we have to, those are some of the values and some of the principles we try to instill in our people. Uh, and then, of course, that takes me into the third aspect of the uh, advantage uh, to your question is the people. You know, it's, it's really all about uh, the caliber and the quality of the people. Uh, and that, of course, is an extremely important element. I, you know, one could go to the extent and say that they are more important than your customers. Because philosophically and practically, the idea is if you look after your people, they will look after your customers. Whereas if you do it the other way around, it's like putting the cart in front of the horse. Mm -hmm. And uh, throughout my experience, it's never worked. So, the, uh, so location, uh, facilities, design, and people, uh, which may or may not necessarily be in that order, but if you can fuse that and if you can blend that uh, and, and um, execute on that, um, uh, again, you're on your way. I always say that it's a, uh, you're on your way, because you're never there, uh, because the 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 environment here, especially in Shanghai in China, which is a challenge in and of itself. How do you keep up with the pace of change? How do you keep up with the new competition that's entering in the marketplace, which I, which which uh, uh, refers to your earlier question, and. And uh, so, so the, the the people aspect is obviously very, very important uh, going forward. And and actually, I might add that this is one of the biggest challenges that the hotel industry is having. Uh, you're going to see as many as 20 new hotels emerging mm -hmm. on just in Shanghai in the next four years. Uh, so these are these are five-star hotels, and many of which will be internationally branded hotels. So again, the challenge is how do you stay abreast of these changes and how do you deal with the competition? Uh, one way is to go back to what I said before about the fundamentals. You know, how are you executing on the fundamentals and how are you leveraging your brand, you know, the, 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 the branding and, and uh, the image that you create in the marketplace and how do you continuously feed that and how do you feed that image so that it gets bigger and bigger and it gets wider and wider rather than the reverse. So, and there are a number of things that we do, uh, which would be too, uh, too many to mention here in the, in the time we have, but uh, it is a concern and we're always uh, looking to find new ways to, uh, to be competitive and to differentiate. Mm -hmm. uh, I might add uh, one thing which I think is very important, not only for hotels but for every business, uh, and, and what I tell our people too is that you, you know, we're not all that interested in, in, in copying or being like somebody else, although we want to know what's going on. There's a big difference between knowing what's going on and copying or imitating or try to be like someone else. Because as far as I know, no one became famous by imitating anyone yeah. else or copying anybody else. So what we try to do is take advantage of the strengths that I mentioned earlier, the three strengths, mm -hmm. and try to leverage on those and do and, and to be the best we can be, basically. You know, mm -hmm. one of the questions, for example, in this regard that I ask people all the time is, is this the best you can do, or conversely, can we do better? But I wouldn't necessarily say, well, they're doing this over there and that over there. Why can't you do any better? Uh, because that's a totally different set of ideas and motivations. So uh, again, that's just one strategic way from a management standpoint where you, you know, focus people on, on bringing out their true potential, not only in terms of their own personal performance, but in terms of leveraging and, and maximizing on the assets that you have. And I think that applies to every business. Yes, um, that's a good point. But what would you say your main clientele um, compared, let's say, international traveler right. and, and the local uh, consumer? Mm -hmm. uh, what would be the ratio? Right. In a way? Well, basically, we have, uh, I would say that half of uh, our 
customers or guests as we call them in our business, uh, most of our customers are uh, local Chinese, uh, Asians, you know, within Asia. Uh, we also have uh, about 20 or 30 percent from the United States, from the Americas, uh, another 15 percent or so from Europe. But again, this all shifts and it all changes. I think, you know, as, as you know, the, the, the market matures and, and more competitors enter the market, um, uh, we, the uh, WTO estimates, for example, that, that China will see a, a growth, a compound a growth of about 10 percent in visitor arrivals. Uh, you know, for the next decade or so. Uh, and when, when you look at the projections for growth, they're quite staggering. I mean, you know, you pick up the newspaper or you listen to television and, and you, you'll, you'll see all of these wonderful statistics quoted. Um, so the, the future looks quite good. You know, we've had, according to uh, Michael Spence, the Nobel laureate who was here recently at Fudan University, he was saying that, uh, that according to his information, um, China is expected to have two more decades of uninterrupted growth on top of the three decades that we've had since the early 70s and Deng Xiaoping's uh, liberalization of the economy and so on. So uh, there is this euphoria, there is this renewed optimism, no doubt about it. Uh, but what's interesting really is, is the, the, the enthusiasm that the young people have, you know, for developing their careers and, and moving forward and taking advantage of uh, uh, of this uh, development, but um, again, uh, the competition is there and always will be there. I remember when, um, you know, when I was in Thailand in the early 80s, it was very much the same as it is now. We were facing exactly the same problems, labor shortages, uh, pretty much the economic conditions were very much the same. I think one of the differences in Thailand, I suppose, was that the national carrier there, Thai Airways, was a catalyst you know, which brought in the Visit Thailand here in 1987. Mm -hmm. To a lesser extent, we don't see that activity with the national airlines in China, for instance. And I think that if now that, uh, you know, one of the uh, principal airlines here, I believe it was China, China Eastern, Eastern uh, yeah. was, was acquired or uh, part of it was acquired by Singapore Airlines, you know, we might see a new vigor, you know, a new attitude at the and, and whereby they will also assist, you know, government uh, bodies to uh, do their part, certainly, uh, you know, to promote tourism. And, you know, Thai Airways was very instrumental in, in developing tourism in Thailand, in addition to the other bodies. Um, just recently, we had a report from Boeing, and they were saying that uh, the, 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 the numbers of people traveling around the world is going to double by the year uh, 2026. I mean, that's pretty sta staggering. So, uh, you know, how do you prepare for all of this? Um, and again, we go back to the human element uh, uh, where uh, we, we, we see uh, people competing for our human resources. Uh, about six months ago or so, I, I bumped into some people who were, look, were looking for uh, people to hire in Macau. You know, the Macau casinos were here ostensibly looking for uh, 40,000 staff. So, you know, Hong Kong is suffering because of that, you know, you know <laughs> the, the, the Macau uh, hotels, uh, casinos are offering right. salaries in U.S. dollars, so they're pulling people out of Hong Kong and they're pulling people out of Singapore and, and pulling people out of, uh, out of uh, Shanghai and the coastal Beijing and the, the coastal cities in China. We, for example, lost six people, six of our principal, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, staff members, management members were, and these people were very happy. I mean, I had the, uh, one of them come into my office and he was in tears, you know, saying, look, I love the hotel and I love to be here, but, you know, they're approaching me with sal my salary increases two and a half times what I'm earning now. So I, the only thing I didn't do was kiss him on the cheek and wish him good luck. Uh, how can you... How can you not encourage someone to take that opportunity? I mean, it's, uh, it's just too lucrative. But this is the sort of thing that's going on. And when you, when you look at, uh, it's not just looking at what's happening in China, you know. It's looking at what's happening in the region, too. You know, you've got to broaden your perspective somewhat. Um, for example, the, there are two casinos uh, in, in Singapore that are sort of in the, in the development stages and so on, and, and Singapore is looking for people because they're short. So they're, they're going to Malaysia, you know, and, and they're paying in Singapore dollars, which is better than the Malaysian ringgit. 
And, uh, of course, the Malaysians can't afford to pay too much because their room rates are so low. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an, there's, there's the knock-on effect everywhere. So the bottom line is that, that we need to accelerate. As an industry, we need to accelerate the development of people. And as I say sometimes to, uh, uh, you know, when I'm invited from time to time to talk to hotel schools, I say that education and then skills learned on the job later on is not enough. You have to know how to speak English. And, and uh, so that's just, it's just as important so that we can attract more people into this industry. Of course, you have to pay people better. You have to have better salary packages and promise careers rather than jobs in the usual. But uh, these, are, these, are, these are real challenges. I mean, this is not a fantasy. Uh, and the situation is getting a lot worse. As a matter of fact, according to Spence again, Michael Spence, he claimed, for example, that by, 2000, by the end of 2009, China is going to be importing labor. Uh -huh. uh, we already have some hotels that are employing Filipinos. Uh -huh. uh, and there's yes. nothing wrong with that. Yeah. You know, they, they speak English, they're very well trained, they have a lot of hotel experience. You know, many of these people work in the Middle East and have been working for years. I remember when I was there. And you know, there, there, is a, there is a pool of people out there, qualified people. But the idea that, you know, in a, in a, in a country of 1.3 billion, uh, there's going to be a, a, a shortage of labor because people won't have the essential and necessary skills exactly. to drive this, this the, the hospitality industry. Yes. I would imagine that uh, other businesses in the luxury sector, you know, would, would more or less have the same challenges yes, because, right. you know, essentially it's all about service and being in the service industry. So. Yeah. Yeah, also know other your professional uh, in hospitality. You are also a writer. I just published a new book, and also have a couple of different columns and uh, mm. most of talk about lifestyle. Well, mm. what, um, look at this, uh, which uh, this uh, large market is blooming. Mm. And uh, what were your key message if you want to deliver to this new wealthy Chinese mm. um, population? Right. Well, you know, I'm always tempted to to answer in a philosophical way whenever it comes to luxury and and you know I, there's always this notion in the back of my mind how much is enough and what's enough you know at the end of the day I you know for me on a personal level I, I look at luxury really on two levels if you like you know on on the the material level and on the spiritual level uh, I happen to appreciate the luxury on the spiritual level more than the material level mm -hmm. um, and, and you know this whole idea that money can't buy love and money can't buy everything and um, a, a lot of that plays into uh, in, into the material side of things uh, and I, I think that that is very important I think that people need you know once especially in China where the standard of living and the incomes are rising um, and, and they're rising in rather dramatic ways you know albeit not in every part of the country and this, this enables people to uh, buy goods and services which they couldn't afford before and make statements about who they are and who they want to be and all this stuff. But, you know, essentially for me, the spiritual luxury, I think, is a lot more, um, is, is of value. I mean, the, the idea of having time for yourself, you know, to reflect and to and have the peace of mind, um, to do the kind of things that give you pleasure the things that you really like to do. Um, I, I think that is a luxury in and of itself. I also think that culture is luxury. You know, having good manners is a luxury. Um, you know, and it may be taking it to extremes, but, you know, we see now in Beijing, for instance, there are different programs to teach people how to be a little more polite and caring for the Olympics. But, um, I, I, you know, I think that that should be the case anyway, regardless of the Olympics. Um, but, you know, to be cultured and to be civilized and to have good taste, I think, is also uh, a, a form of luxury. Uh, so, um, you know, having said that, um, for me, um, you know, having, having other people, for example, do what I don't want to do uh, is, is a luxury also. And that's why hotels, the, the, the luxury aspect in hotels, I think, is a lot deeper than the physical stuff that you actually see or buy or experience, you know. It, it's really all about caring people who certainly uh, uh, try to understand what it is that makes different people happy and then provide that unconditionally 
uh, pampering. You know, everybody likes to be pampered. Everybody likes to be recognized. And unfortunately, not all of us do that very well. And again, this is a journey. It's not a destination. Uh, and this is why I always, like, I, I always think, think in terms of you got to start somewhere and you got to keep going. But you never really get there. And the more we can um, pamper, please recognize people. You know, sometimes people ask me, you know, what business are you in? Well, the obvious answer is... Pamper business. <laughs> <laughs> I think you answered that better than I did. Uh, but, you know, you, you, what business are we in? You know, and of course the obvious answer might be the obvious answer because everybody's been in a hotel and everybody stayed in a hotel. And everybody has an answer for that. But really it comes down to, uh, to uh, pampering and recognition. I think those two things are very key. So if you can establish your upper uh, modus operandi, if you like, around those ideas, under those concepts, the other thing is that I think ought to be mentioned is that, you know, luxury really is a European concept, as we know. And in all fairness, you know, uh, China here is really at the cusp of all of this development and, and uh, it, it being introduced to luxury, enjoying luxury and all this. And it takes time, you know, it's, 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 it, it, for it to be integrated and absorbed into the culture. Uh, if you look at Europe, for example, the, the major brands, as you know, it's taken them many, many years to develop an image and a name and a reputation. So uh, sometimes I come across people here who are just impatient. You know, you hear people talk about, well, you know, we need to develop Chinese brands and we need to compete with the foreign brands and so on. And it makes for good fodder, you know, it makes for a great conversation, and especially over a glass, of, a good glass of wine. But uh, at the end of the day, it's going to take time. It took time everywhere else. So I, I think uh, time needs to be taken to, so, so it can be done right too. Okay. Uh, thank you, Peter, to sh today to share us with your experience in luxury marketing, but also your definition of uh, luxury. Uh, thank you for watching. This is ITV Asia, and uh, I'm your host, Claire Chen, and see you soon. <laughs>